Well, hey, everybody, thanks for joining us today. I'm excited today to have my friend Rich Philotus with us. Uh, Rich is a pastor in uh, New York. Uh, in fact, I went to Rich's church years ago for a conference, and my buddy who was joining me up there said, yeah, it's in New York. Just stay wherever you usually stay. So I stayed in Manhattan. Well, Rich is in Queens, and that's not really the same. <laughs> That was an expensive Uber ride. <laughs> but that yeah, traffic, Rich, I'll tell you. I'm saying that, hey, Rich, thanks for joining us today, man. Appreciate well, thanks, it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, enjoying, uh, looking forward to a good conversation. Yeah, and, and I, you know, we've met, but a lot of our listeners probably haven't met you. So I'd love it if you just give us a little intro, a little bit about your story and, uh, you know, what got you where you are today. Yeah, I, I am. I, when I introduce myself, I like to begin just I'm the son of Richard Sr. and Nicolasa Velotis, uh, descendants of uh, just from Puerto Rico. So and uh, I am a native New Yorker from Brooklyn and uh, I lived in Brooklyn for 34 years and moved to Queens seven years ago. Uh, so uh, all I know is New York, man, uh, Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, I pastor New Life Fellowship Church, which is a 33-year-old church, which was started by a guy named Pete Scazzaro, uh, who's written a number of books on emotional health and uh, spirituality. And uh, some seven years ago, I became the lead pastor at New Life. Uh, it's quite a congregation. We, we are located in what National Geographic has called the most diverse zip code in the world. Uh, over 123 languages spoken in our neighborhood. Uh, over 75 nations represented in our church. And so it's a beautiful and complicated place. And uh, I have the privilege of uh, shepherding that congregation there. So uh, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. So you and Pete uh, had the formal transition. Uh, how long ago? That was 2013, 2013, but it was a four year plan. So it started in 2009. I was brought into the process in 2011 and then 2013 is when uh, the official uh, transition happened. So about a two-year overlap. Two-year overlap, yep. yep. Yeah. And just so listeners know, um, I tell our team all the time, if you've seen one succession plan, and we've done hundreds and hundreds of them, if you've seen one succession plan, you've seen one succession plan. <laughs> <laughs> so two years is not the emotionally healthy overlap. It's not the cookie cutter. Don't, don't go, oh, yeah. I got to do two years. That's what Pete did. Because, man, Pete, yeah. Pete is so wise, and he's written um, so much that's been helpful to pastors. And that's, that leads me to today. Uh, you've got a new book out called The Deeply Formed Life. Mm -hmm. And I'd love it if you'd give me like the elevator pitch for what you're trying to do with the book. And then I want to dive into a little bit of the why behind that. Yeah, what I'm trying to do is really offer an ambitious reframing of spiritual formation. And for me, what that means is uh, how do we think formationally about some of the larger issues before us? Uh, spiritual formation is often seen in, you know, regarding prayer, solitude, silence, some of the classic individual practices. Uh, and while I uh, embrace that, I'm, I'm thinking, how do we think uh, formationally about issues like race, issues like sexuality, issues like justice? So I talk about five values. Those five values are contemplative rhythms, racial justice, interior examination, sexual wholeness, and missional presence. And uh, I think these are five urgent areas of formation for us. And uh, I'm tr so I'm trying to reframe spiritual formation a little more robustly. So, so I have uh, written a few books and while I have seven children, I've never been through labor, but writing a book sure feels like getting something out of me that needs to get out. Yeah. And uh, my wife tells me, yep, that's kind of what labor is, but <laughs> mine's more painful. So, uh, so writing a book's not as painful as labor, but <laughs> it's it's something that's got to get out of you. What was the kind of the holy discontent in you that made you say, I have to write a book about this? Yeah, you know, when I thought about the book, those five values I, I write about have been really the values of our congregation for a number of years. And those five, we use different language, but it's essentially those five. And when I thought about writing it, I thought about Eugene Peterson. When Eugene Peterson... Um, before, before translating the or paraphrasing the Bible, I mean, the message translation started out with a Bible study. Uh, I believe it was the book of Galatians and his congregation really didn't understand what was happening in the church. And he wanted to give accessible 
language, contextualized language for his own people. And one thing led to the next, and next thing you know, the, the whole Bible was paraphrased by Peterson. Uh, in, a same, in a similar way, uh, the book was written out of pastoral urgency for me because I wanted the people that I shepherd to really grasp how we're trying to follow Jesus in Queens, how we're trying to bear witness to Christ in the particular uniqueness of our congregation in our setting. And so that's the primary reason I wanted to get something in the hands of my congregants to say, what do we mean when we talk about slowing down our lives? What do we mean when we talk about racial justice? What do we mean about uh, looking within and uh, finding healing for the interior world that we have inside of us? How do we uh, hold sexuality and spirituality together? How do we live justly in the world? So th that's kind of the, the reason. But beyond that, personally, I've been shaped by these values for many, many years. Um, I'm 41. I became a Christian at 19. I was introduced to the contemplative tradition as about a 21, 22 year old. And so I've been thinking about contemplation. I've been thinking about prayer. And then throughout my life, different seasons would bring in different emphases, if you will, regarding race, justice, emotional health, etc. And so these things have been in me for a couple of decades. And, um, and then I wanted to offer a paradigm to say, to think about formation in the world we live in needs to encompass some of the more challenging issues of our day. And so all those reasons are the reasons, uh, you know, go into why I needed to birth this thing and, and get it out into the world. So I, I imagine you were writing this before this spring, but man, if you'd have told me, now I, we've been at the front of working with diversity for a long time, mm -hmm. but if you'd have told me there are five key issues you need for spiritual formation and racial justice is one of them, I would have said, that's, that's overreaching, man. Yeah. Uh, did, did you, did you, hear that from anyone before you wrote the book? Because I mean, yeah, where you live in Queens, 120 some languages spoken and the most diverse zip code, sure. But yeah. the church I pastored in Alabama, not really something they're thinking about in the, in the neighborhood that is very homogenous. So yeah. talk to me about that particular issue before this spring. And since the uh, events of this spring, Mr. Floyd's death, uh, all of the you know protesting that's happened yeah. since then, the, the after, because that's got to have radically shifted from when you first started writing to, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, I just released a book in the middle of this. Yeah, I would hear from time to time, like uh, where racial justice or racial reconciliation, with it, whichever term people uh, tend to use, is kind of an addendum to faith. And, you know, if you can get to it, good, but if you can't, we understand. And for me, that was, uh, that response is really, um, uh, has to do with a truncated view of the gospel, where the gospel is not just some kind of soteriological transaction. You know, it's not just a fancy way of, which is a fancy way of just saying getting saved or about some kind of atonement theory. Uh, the gospel's good news that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's crucified, risen from the dead. He's enthroned, uh, and he's making all things new. And one of the things that he's making new is a new family in his name. And to talk about the new family in his name is to talk about uh, the, the, the barriers that need to come down. This is Ephesians 2 kind of language, Jew Gentile. So from the very inception of the Christian story and the gospel story, our barriers coming down between ethnic groups, uh, we wouldn't necessarily use racial term terminology. It's kind of thinking backwards. But, um, but from a racial ethnic perspective, the Bible has a lot to say. And so mm -hmm. depending on how robust your definition of the gospel is or, or not robust, uh, matters of race will either be, um, you know, an afterthought, a footnote or something core to the gospel message. And for us, and yes, it's lived out in Queens, but I think this is the gospel story. Uh, it should be lived out no matter where we are. Uh, yeah. So my understanding of the gospel is what drives this urgency for this particular value. It's, uh, I've told this story to some of my staff members before, but years ago when I was at Princeton for seminary, I was listening to a, a sermon from Dr. Gillespie, who's a president, and he was preaching from John 21. And, you know, Peter sees the Lord risen and he gets dressed and then jumps in the water. Yeah. So weird. But, but, uh, but then they bring their nets in and they have a fish fry. And, and when they bring the nets in, John takes the time to say, there were 153 fish in the net. 
Mm. And John's not a detail guy. John's a lover. He's a, you know, this big, it's why it's the first one you tell a new believer, go read John. Cause it's like, oh, this is a great read. This is like the, you know, uh, the Daniel Steele of the gospels. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's not Luke this precise, right? So it's like, why 153, John? Mm. It, why? And so it's been this big question for years and years. And, and you get the numerologists who are like, well, one plus five plus three is one God and the five books of the Pentateuch and the Trinity and, right. and one plus five plus three is eight or nine and nine's a perfect number. And, and Dr. Gillespie said, look, I, of all the explanations I've read, I don't know if this one's true or not, but this is the one I like the best. <laughs> at, but most scholars agree that at the time John wrote that gospel, there were about 153 identifiable people groups. Hmm. And there's a reason Jesus said, bring in all these different kind of fish, because hmm. I want you feed my sheep does not mean feed the Jewish people. <laughs> it, it means all of the people groups. Hmm. And uh, I, I know that race is a very real topic to talk about, and, and particularly uh, sensitive in african-american communities right now but it's a much bigger thing in the gospel and mm -hmm. I, I just really appreciate that with you so so while we're on current events um 2020 great year to release a book right <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, yeah I, I did not foresee the the weeks after the book releasing that i'd be uh, in on a chair here in my bedroom, having conversations like this here, but but here we are. <laughs> yeah, I had one uh, our newest Succession book released, oh, like the worst week ever, like the third week in March. And it's like, <laughs> gosh, you know. So we're gonna re-release it later, but yeah, it, it, it's it's a it's a crazy time, and as it's we're talking now in mid October, um, I talk to pastors and the feeling. Yeah, I can sense it, mm -hmm. and I'm a Presbyterian. We don't sense things very well, so I, I'm a. I can feel the fatigue, mm -hmm. and I'm just wondering as you talk about these core disciplines, which aren't really like Bible study principles; they're life formation, right? Mm -hmm. So, so what should we be asking ourselves about whether we're burning ourselves out? And, and that kind of gets back to your predecessor and everything being balanced and healthy, but. How do these five principles help us form questions that we should ask ourselves so that we don't end up in an unhealthy spot? Yeah, when I, that's a great question. And um, you know, when I think about the five values that I write about, there's two of them in particular that I think uh, resonate for, within this particular moment. And it is you know, those contemplative rhythms and the interior examination values. With regard to the contemplative rhythms, um, you know, I was, I was 28 when I got to New Life. And uh, I remember when I was interviewed for the pastoral position by my predecessor, Pete, and um, he was creating a, an environment of rhythms, an environment of where, you know, Henry Nouwen talks about, we need a ministry of absence and we need a ministry of presence. Uh, we can't, uh, and it's, all, it's often when we learn to leave that the spirit can come. That's the language that now in use. And so we must have rhythms of leaving and rhythms of returning. And so I remember being interviewed by Pete at the diner near the church. And he said to me, just kind of casually, Rich, do you know the only way you'll get fired at New Life? And so, you know, the French fry that I was chewing just fell out my mouth and I sat up a bit straight. And he said, I said, I have no idea. And, and he said, the only way you'll get fired at new life, and I think he was speaking a bit hyperbolically, but he said is, if you don't Sabbath weekly. And I was like, huh, uh, usually it's, you'll get fired if you don't do your work. And I, he said, if you don't Sabbath weekly, you won't make it here. And he said, because you won't have the kind of depth of life that's required mm. to sustain the work you're doing as a pastor. Mm. And um, from that point on, I mean, I had heard about Sabbath, I had experimented here and there, but it became now uh, an expectation that I would rest and my work would flow out of my rest. Uh, and so I've been keeping Sabbath for almost 13 years now, weekly, a 24 hour period of stopping, resting, delighting, contemplating, stopping our paid and unpaid work. And so when the pandemic hit, because this has been in you know, the air that I breathe and the water that I drink the past 13 years, um, the only thing I knew what to do was when the Sabbath comes to rest. 
And um, there were certainly moments, I mean, in March, there was so much disorientation and what are we going to do? How are we going to meet? Uh, and, but all I knew was I would, my body has been formed for 13 years that when 6 p.m. Friday comes, I'm stopping what I'm doing. No more sermon prep, no more phone calls, no more Zoom, anything. And, uh, you know, the, the verse that has been most instructive for me is Colossians 1.17. Actually, this verse became my kind of pastor verse when I had tuberculosis in 2015. And um, I was getting all these tests. It was lymphatic tuberculosis in my lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. And while I was getting tested and biopsies and all that, um, there was months of uncertainty about what this was. And so I cling to, to Colossians 1.17, which says that Jesus Christ is before all things and in him all things hold together. And that verse became my verse in terms of Christ is holding together the church. Christ is holding together everything. And so because he's holding it together, I don't have to. I'm going to Sabbath. Uh, and so for me, that became just a rate. Now, that doesn't mean I haven't been fatigued. I mean, I've been the most tired I've been this year in the past seven months than I've ever been in any kind of leadership role. Mm. Preaching to screens, meeting with people over and over via screens. Uh, I, like I mentioned before our meeting, you know, I'm now a principal of a homeschool academy where I have two students, a six-year-old son and 11-year-old daughter who's in middle school now, whose Wi-Fi, my Wi-Fi goes out from time to time. Kids are screaming. I'm trying to work on a sermon. It's, a, it's awful. And, well, um, you're not you're not just the principal of that school. You're the custodian. You're the lunch lady. You're that's right. the <laughs> that's right. my wife is the chancellor for sure. <laughs> He's really running the show here. <laughs> and so I volunteer. Can I be the cook today? Can I just I just I'll put my lunch? You take the six year old and help him cook his mat. You know, so <laughs> so I'll cook no problem. Uh, so that's the pressure of the day. And so, the, but those rhythms of Sabbath of how can we instill recreation in our family and rest and take good naps? That's the first thing. And then the second piece in terms of the fatigue is the interior examination. My levels of anxiety have increased the past seven months like never before. And the anxiety of uh, masks or no masks, the anxiety of a pol political hostility, the anxiety of racial injustice, the anxiety of, uh, you know, um, who's leaving the church. I can't, I don't see people anymore as much as I used to on Sundays. So how so-and-so doing? Oh, so-and-so moved. I found out three months later. So it's like the, the, the wear and tear of, of leading in this moment has been very difficult, but the interior examination piece for me has been critical in terms of uh, me regularly looking within to identify points of anxiety, and then to find spaces to externalize that for the sake of my own, not just catharsis, but perspective and healing, whether it's with my wife, whether it's with a therapist, whether it's with a, 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 past, you know, a group of pastor friends that I meet with monthly. Uh, and so I've needed to um, pay attention to the, my, my inner life and my soul, and it hasn't been easy. Uh, but I think there are tools that have come my way over the years to help me navigate some of that. So the contemplative rhythms and the interior examination has uh, helped me navigate, not perfectly for sure, but I don't know what, how I'd be without these things. Yeah, let's go backwards from that because I want to park there for a minute. The interior examination, you're saying that, and I'm reminded of uh, talking to Adrian, my wife. Uh, her grandmother is 93, I think. She's 90 something, right? Child of the depression, you know, World War II, the whole thing, right? And way before the pandemic, she used to talk about, I mean, she's the kind that they've had a nice life and you'll find their nice silverware and right next to it is a stack of Subway napkins that they've taken from Subway. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> doesn't matter how well you've done, child of the depression, you may not have napkins one day. Oh, and <laughs> a lot of ketchup packets. Or whatever <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. So, you know, I remember talking to her one time and say, how'd you deal with all that confusion? And this was before the pandemic. She said, well, you know, when I figured out when life is out of control, I have to find the things I can control mm. and just go high control on those. Mm. And that gives me some, and I don't know if that kind of resonates with you, but like I've actually hit the treadmill more in the last mm. seven months than I have probably in the last 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. And some of that's working out frustrating, but some of it is me going back to her saying, 
okay, what can I control? I can right. control my fitness to some extent. Mm -hmm. I, I can control my nutrition. May not be able to control where the church is open or not. And so I don't know if that's hitting on it or not, but like what are some tangible steps for the, the interior examination that would be helpful? Yeah, and I think along those lines, first of all, it's, you know, when I think about um, the control piece here, I, I think what, what are the outlets that are required um, to, to nurture and nourish my soul, my body, and whatever it looks like. I mean, we, we, we all need some escape in the healthiest sense of, 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 the way, of that word. The challenge becomes when um, we are now using God or whatever it is to avoid ourselves. Hmm. Uh, and so what I have discovered in my own life is when I am not doing the work of interior examination, uh, you know, the story for here, this, it's, it, it's the story of like, you know, when I got my first, my third car kind of illustrates this. Uh, my first car was a, a 19, uh, 89 Oldsmobile Royale. My grant, my uncle sold it to me. Uh, didn't get the nephew discount, but he, he sold it to me. It broke down in three months. Uh, my second car was a 1988 Nissan Sentra. Uh, a brother in the church sold it to me. I did not get the brother in Christ discount. And that car broke down in like two months. So I had saved some money. I was working in a mail room at this uh, municipal bonds uh, company in, uh, in the financial district in Manhattan. I, I was 18 and already had like a 401k, had lots of money already within the first couple of years put away. Wow. But uh, I needed to go to college. And so I emptied out all my funds from the 401k. I mean, we're not talking a lot, a lot, but enough to buy me a car. They charged me 30% uh, to take out that money. Uh, and I bought my 1995 Nissan Altima and uh, drove it around. And then I remember driving up on college one day. The only thing I know how to do with a car is park it, parallel park in New York. You have to do that really well and, and drive it and put gas in it. But I'm not a fixer. I don't work on my hands well. Right. Uh, and one day the car started making a noise voo, 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 as I'm on the campus. And I thought, that's a problem. And it just was so irritating. I thought the only way I can address this problem is by lifting the windows up and blasting the music. And that's exactly what I did. I lifted the windows up, blast, and I was like, wow, that feels great. I, I can't hear that sound anymore. A day later, I'm on the highway heading down from uh, Rockland County, New York, down to Brooklyn, and the tire explodes on the highway, just a massive boom. And thankfully, it was early enough where there was no one on the road, uh, you know, scared to dig lights out of me here. And uh, and I realized what a, as I'm fixing the tire on the side, I'm thinking what a metaphor for life when there's a lot of woo, woo, woo sound going on and we just say, you know, I'm just going to ignore it, throw up the window, blast the music, but sooner or later there's a boom. And uh, I've recognized that in my own soul where how do I find proper outlets for my own restoration, my own joy, uh, but that doesn't lead me to a place where I am avoiding myself. Anxiety comes, you know, there's different kinds of anxieties. There's acute anxiety and there's chronic anxiety. Acute anxiety is situational. It's time-based. It's something happened and, and the moment has come and the moment's gone. But then there's chronic anxiety. And I deal with chronic anxiety because, and I know it's chronic anxiety when I get an email from someone, I haven't even read it. And I just see the name and I'm already like, oh God, who is that? What do they want today? or someone sends me a text message, like someone earlier today said, Rich, can we talk? And I'm thinking, oh, what is it now? And I realized there is some underlining chronic anxiety that I have to address. And so for me, reflection, uh, you know, I'm sitting in this chair, I have my, my journal, I'm regularly taking note of the anxiety moment and what are the stories I'm telling myself? And so, well, there's actually a five question template I use whenever there's disproportionate reactions in me, or I'm just feeling anxiety flood through my body. Five questions I use. So whether it's an email that I received, the criticism I received from someone, and the five questions are as follows. What happened? What am I feeling? What's the story I'm telling myself? What's the gospel say? And what's the counter instinctual act I need to give myself to? And uh, those- say that, say that, say that one more time. I want to so hear it again. What happened? Okay, I got criticized. And I now, what am I feeling? Great anxiety and shame. What's the story I'm telling myself? I'll never be competent. 
I'll, I'll never be the kind of leader that I, I, I want to be. What's the gospel say? God uses broken, frail people. What's the mm -hmm. counter instinctual act I need? For me personally, I tend to, uh, you know, turn in on myself with that and go down a hole. For me, the counter instinctual act is to externalize that. And it's not maybe not, it might be something else for someone else. But for me, it's, I need to talk to my wife. I need to talk to a friend. Hey, this is the shame I'm mm -hmm. feeling today. This is the, this is the anxiety I'm holding. And uh, when I do that, it's amazing how I'm able to not just be self-regulated, but come to a better place of understanding the grace of God, having mm -hmm. greater self-compassion for myself. But I've used those five questions regularly in this pandemic uh, because there's plenty of room for anxiety. Wow. Wow. So let's back up to the prior one, keeping Sabbath. Uh, you know, we do a lot. We help churches find their pastors. We help schools find their headmasters and Christian businesses. And well, we started with church and, you know, we get to handle some really cool successions where it's gone well and it's going to be an extension of that. We also have the ones that aren't so fun. Mm -hmm. You know, I get the call, William, the church blew up. William, the pastor, you want to talk about the only ways you can lose your job. You said that, and I knew the answer would be not what I was thinking, but nor, it's pretty simple in church work. Um, stay, keep your financial integrity and your sexual integrity, and you get a lot of, lot of latitude on everything else. I mean, it's, it's really not hard. So, so, so you know, I, I've looked at guys, and it's guys most of the time, that have just self-destructed. Mm. And, 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 and they're not bad people, so to speak. I mean, we label them as bad because it makes me feel better. It makes us all feel yeah. better, but, but they're not bad. And you're like, what is the deal? And I've looked forever for common denominators. And I'll tell you, the closest I've come to it is you show me a pastor who has, quote, failed or whatever word you want to use. Show me a pastor who's failed. I'll show you a tired pastor. Mm. I think there's almost always a straight line from the self-destruct button, whether you intentionally or unintentionally hit it, back to a tiredness mm. that could have been solved through Sabbath. So I want to hear from you. You, you gave us those five questions for, yeah. for self-examination. What about Sabbath? I, Rich, I can't keep Sabbath 24 hours a day. Do you, what do you do when you get on the elevator? Do you push the button or do you get somebody else to push the button? Cause like, I mean, how Sabbath is Sabbath. Yeah. And, 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 and particularly in a time where we've been in lockdown, we may head back into another one. The boundary between the place you rest and the place you work is non-existent. Yeah. So what, what are you learning about Sabbathing and where, and give me like some practical start here yeah. and, and move forwards. Yeah. These are great. And these are questions that I've heard regularly and I'm in conversation with folks a lot in this here. Uh, you know, again, I've been doing this for 13 years experimenting and this has been uh, the season where it's been most difficult because exactly what you said, this is my, I mean, I'm in a 900 square foot apartment in Queens. Uh, this is my office, uh, you know, my bedroom and you know, the kids are just right, outside that door doing their homework. So the, the, it, the lines are blurred in terms of work and in terms of rest, uh, but we've had to be incredibly uh, disciplined with it. But uh, I wanna just give some easy handles for some folks who are wondering about this. The first thing I think is important to know about Sabbath, just theologically, is that the Sabbath is not really about uh, resting so that I can work more efficiently although that is a byproduct of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is to resist the idol of efficiency. That's what mm. Sabbath is. So it's, Sabbathing mm. is going to make you more efficient, but that's not why we do it. The primary reason we do it is to resist the idol of efficiency, the idol of productivity, the idol of accomplishment. It's I, I am more than what I produce. And so the Sabbath mm. is perhaps the greatest expression of the gospel of grace because it's intentionally while I'm doing nothing that God loves me. And so it is at that place, that's the theological starting point. And, uh, you know, in, in, in Exodus 20, Deut Deuteronomy 5, where the commandments are listed, you know, the Sabbath is the fourth one. And, um, you know, the people of God had one identity, work, slaves, work. They did not know themselves apart from work. 
here in the, the, the uh, commandments come, the fourth commandment, you shall rest, keep Sabbath. Uh, this was really hard for them, especially when there's 400 years where your sole identity is you're a slave and you work. And we all have an inner Pharaoh inside of us. Mm. He's a slave driver who wants, who says, if you stop working, you're going to die. If you stop working, your business is going to die. If you stop working, your church is going to die. If you stop working, the nonprofit's going to die. Uh, and so the starting point, again, is not just efficiency. It's resisting the idol of efficiency and entrusting your life to God. Having said all that, um, and that's a struggle for me on a regular basis because I feel, oh, if I can just send out that one more email or I got to work on this last illustration. Uh, and it kind of like the, the, the image for me is the food network, you know, Iron Chef, after an hour, the timer's up, you know, they raise their hand in the air. And it's like, you cannot put add another garnish. You can't add anything else. And for me, that's the Sabbath. I've done all I could. Now I need to put my hands in the air, wave them like I just don't care, and then come back 24 hours and start again. Uh, and so that's kind of the theological framework of it. In terms of the practical framework of it, we use four words at New Life to uh, frame the Sabbath, and it's stop, rest, delight, and contemplate. Mm. By stopping, we're saying we're going to stop our paid and unpaid work. And this is uh, the, the, the greatest enemy of Sabbath keeping is legalism. Because if you think I have to do it perfectly, oh, I didn't do it perfectly, it, this sucks, I'll never do it again. So that's, you know, just let go of the legalism. You're going to fail at it. It's all good, but let's experiment together. But I stopped my oh, paid work. And unpaid well, that's, that's, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. that's so critical. I mean, you know, you think of the um, old reform guy. So we talk about the two tablets of the law, right? Mm -hmm. The, the, first four commandments are about honoring God and the last six are about honoring other people. I, I actually, I might be a little heretical here, but I, I think that's not right. I think mm. the first three are honoring God. The last six are, are honoring others. And the fourth is a bridge. Mm. Um, it's, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's about right. God, but, but Jesus said, no, God didn't make you for the Sabbath. God made the Sabbath for you. Yeah. And, and it's fascinating to me. I had to memorize the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Yeah. Uh, they actually paid us at seminary. There was a scholarship and I needed money. So I did it. <laughs> and uh, I, I realized when I was memorizing it, there are more words in the fourth commandment than in mm -hmm. all the other ones combined. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the reason is if you break that, you'll start breaking the others. And so if, if, let's oh, see, if you don't yeah. rest, yeah. If you don't rest, you are liable to violate the sixth commandment. Do not murder. If you don't, if you don't rest, you're liable to violating the seventh commandment. Do not commit adultery. If That's you right. don't rest, you're liable to start cutting corners and stealing, start uh, bearing false witness, start coveting. I mean, you, I mean, the dead on, the dead on. If we're not, if we're tired, we, we do some bad stuff when we're tired and fatigued and exhausted. And so I think that might be the reason why. That's really uh, good. That serves That's as really a good. Turning point of the, of the commandment. So, um, yeah, great, great insight. So, I mean, so st we stop our paid work and unpaid work for us in our home. That means uh, we stop. I, I mean, I, I'm not writing any sermons. I'm not responding to emails. I'm not taking phone calls from congregants. Uh, I stop. Also, I'm, we're not doing laundry. We're not doing grocery shopping. We're not doing the things that constitute work for us. Now, again, people are listening, probably going, but what about, but what about, but what about? I get it. Yes. So let me just give a large frame. Then there's rest. You know, what are the things that replenish? Uh, and so what are, you know, this is good self-care now. Uh, I mean, the Quaker author Parker Palmer said that self-care is never a selfish act. It's simply good stewardship of the only gift that I've been given. That is me. I'm the gift to the world. You know, my life wow. is a gift. And so to rest is about self-care, stewardship. I'm stewarding my body, my soul, my mind. And so, I mean, I rest a little bit more on the Sabbath. I, I, I don't apologize for taking a nap on the couch on the Sabbath. I, and my wife and I, we have to negotiate our schedules. We have two small kids. Sure. I don't know about everybody else's kids, but when the Sabbath starts, my kids don't just turn into angels. They, their demons continue to manifest during the Sabbath. And so it's not like a glorious time. Okay, the Sabbath started children and oh, okay, we want to pray, daddy. No, they're fighting even more. And so and that's so, awesome. I don't want to uh, glamorize this whole sensationalize it, romanticize it here. Uh, the third part is delighting. And this is the most challenging part for adults because the older we become, the older we get, the more delight deficient we become, which is why I think one of the reasons Jesus says be like children is because children know how to delight. They know how to take joy in things. 
And the older we get, we have a hard time with that. Mm. And so what does it mean to do the things that restore your soul creatively? My father-in-law who started keeping Sabbath a few, he goes to our church. He started keeping Sabbath a few years ago. And um, he is a gifted water painter. He did not know that. I mean, he loved art when he was a child, but had two jobs, worked faithfully for many years. He quit one of his jobs a couple of years ago and said, I have time for a Sabbath now. I'm going to take up water painting. And on his Sabbath, he is creating. And if you see, I mean, I've posted on my social media, I have some of his artwork of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Martin Luther King, Eugene Peterson, these, um, these images in my office because they're so incredible. But he discovered delighting those and then contemplating. It's really, you know, how, how do we make space for prayer and silence and attending to the spirit of God in our lives? So those are the four kind of uh, frameworks, pillars of Sabbath for us. And the two questions we ask very simply are this, what do I need to stop doing? What do I need to start doing? And mm. for those who say, I can't take a 24 hour period, that's fine. But what can you start with? Can you start with eight hours? Can you start with 12 hours? I mean, again, we're not trying to be legalistic here. This is a gift for you to receive. You don't have to do it, you get to do it. And if we can begin somewhere and work our way up, uh, I think we will find our lives just with greater, uh, you know, vitality, sustainability, longevity. Um, and so I am experienced fatigue, but I'm not burned out, although I'm tired. And I think a big part of it is because of this weekly rhythm that I have. That's really helpful. It feels like uh, uh, we were in our all staff meeting today and everybody's sharing of course via Zoom right now, but uh, our COO was thanking all the people on our team for their works. Like you guys have been running a marathon. And I corrected him, I said, you know, actually, I think we were sold a one mile uphill race. And then every mile we find ourselves at the bottom of the hill again, <laughs> and they won't tell us when the last rep's going to be. Right. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, I know we've just scratched the surface of uh, the deeply formed life, but, but man, this rest keeping this battling fatigue, mm. uh, it might be uh, the most fruitful talk I've had on a podcast in a long time because you've helped me. And I'm hoping that it's helping others. There are all kinds of fatigue out there. And every time I think I've heard the story of the worst situation, I hear another one that's even worse. So uh, thank you so much, Rich, for sharing those really practical helps with us. Um, it's the deeply formed life. Um, if you're wondering where do I get a copy or that sort of thing, just, I, you know, Volotus is kind of like Vanderbilt. Just go to Amazon and try to spell it. It'll, it'll get you there. You know, it's... It, uh, it, it, I didn't like my name growing up, but I love it now because it searches and I'm betting you're the same way. Uh, it's, our our books uh, might, be, might be next to each other in uh, Barnes and Noble or something like that there. That's great. That's great. And, and we'll also put all the links to Rich and to the church and to the book in our show notes. If you're not a part of that uh, distribution list, just go to vandernews.com and sign up. We won't beat you up with Ginsu knife orders, you know, offers, but uh, we'll, we'll send you show notes and let you have the links and a preview of what's coming next. So Rich, thank you so much. You're doing amazing work and really the release of this book, racial reconciliation, having a deeply formed life in the craziest year that mm. I've been alive. Uh, only God could have planned it this way. Mm. And, and thank you for listening to him and answering him before uh, for building an ark before there was a flood. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, appreciate so you, much, man. Bro. Enjoyed our conversation. Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah. Take care.